is the Christian journey really all about? Is it resting or striving? And does human effort play a part? Welcome to Word for the Week, Season 3, Episode 9, as we discuss resting versus striving. My first instinct is to say that the Christian walk is God-working and not human effort. Yep, you come across as non-biblical, unless you put it that way. (laughs) And so we can say rightly so, because really, how often have people messed up because they've tried to do a God thing through human effort, and it doesn't come out so well. Uh, And yet, it's not as straightforward as we might think. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, carrying a cross is some pretty serious effort on the part of those carrying. And yet Jesus also said, come, uh, you know, come to me, all you who are labor uh, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we have both things going on there. That's true. And the letters of the New, in the New Testament speak in the same way. Mm-hmm. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. And the same Apostle Paul also wrote, Philippians 3, 12 through 15, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Right. I mean, it's quite a comparison. In one, uh, it's pointed out it's not any of your doing. And the next one, you're, he's talking about straining and all of this. Right. Uh, and for a comparison of human effort versus resting in God, how about we read um, these two passages? And again, just pointing out there once again by the same writer. Okay. 1 Corinthians nine twenty five through 27. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Then Philippians 4, 5 through 7. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right, and now as we read this, the first one, Paul seems to be talking about a nearly superhuman effort Mm -hmm. uh, that he puts in to follow God. And yet in the second passage, and one I've always loved to, I've always loved that saying, the peace of God which surpasses Mm -hmm. all understanding. I think that's a lot of people's favorite verse. I know Kelly loves that one. (laughs) Oh, it's beautiful. But, you know, I finally got in and and looked over the transliteration. You're looking into the Greek words Mm -hmm. exactly. And it's a little slightly different uh, understanding when you say the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's it's, you get the idea, man, I don't know why I'm so peaceful, but I am. Mm. But the word in there actually means something that ha- is superior to or has more power than. So it's more like the peace of God, which is superior. It's more powerful than anything you're going through or will go through, and it will guard you. So it actually makes even more sense in, in the original Greek in that way. So... Not a piece that's simply more than we can understand, but is more powerful than anything in this world that this war can throw. Yeah, anything the world can throw at us. That's exactly yeah. So, how do we reconcile these two ongoing themes of rest and strive in Scripture? Now, I'll concede uh, what I'm about to do is a bit dangerous. Uh Don't try this at home. (laughs) Leave it for the experts. (laughs) <laughs> which is not me. <laughs> but anyway, um, it, it is. I'm, I'm going to look at uh, trying to balance in terms of two theological words. And as soon as you throw out theological, everybody starts feeling intimidated and constrained. And they'll feel even more so because I'll, now I'll say the two words, transformation and sanctification. But uh, the good news is I think we can break these down in very, very simple terms that even I understand. Very, very simple terms. (laughs) (laughs) So what do they mean? (laughs) Okay. Well, let's go for the simple terms that even Kevin can understand. (laughs) Sanctification or to sanctify, Mm -hmm. at, at the very root of it means to set aside. Here, you know, we have a glass of water and and I'll take a sip right now just to prove the point. (laughs) You and I have set aside this glass 
uh, for the purpose of wetting our whistle or our throats as if we get dry. Right. So it's set aside. So take that word in a biblical t context. Of course, it does mean to purify and, and to remove guilt. It can mean that. But the basis of it is to set aside and in biblical terms, that would be to set aside, not just for a practical purpose, but for a holy purpose involving God. So we can come up with this little shorthand whenever we use the word sanctify. We're saying, here is God who is setting you aside for a holy purpose or a holy use. Ooh, being, being dedicated to a holy purpose gives me the impression of going into action in some way. I, I like that. that Holy purpose. Yeah, yeah, it does. And like you say, it implies action. You have a purpose. There's always an action, right? Going mm -hmm. with the purpose. Um, so uh, oh, an example is, uh, would be Paul, as far as practical example, he says, I can do all things right. through Christ who strengthens me. So the Christ who strengthens me, there's the, he's set aside for something God wants him to do. He's going to have to, he, he's acknowledging, it'll be by God's power and God's direction, mm. but it's going to be Paul who ends up exerting the effort to do whatever that is to do. So right. so a person doesn't have to read too far either into the New Testament to realize, you know what, the Apostle Paul put out all kinds of effort, yeah. uh, so it, it fits. Um, this. I remember the map of Paul's missionary journeys in what is now northern Turkey. Mm. He climbed some of the steepest paths on earth to get to those cities. Uh, he certainly did. And I mean, we can, that's one thing about topography. We can pull it up today and look at it. Mm. Uh, and what's even more, uh, not just um, he trudged up those paths, but if historians are right, he actually in the lowlands caught a form of malaria and was recuperating. So he was climbing those paths while he's getting over malaria. So there is some serious human effort going on. No question. Um, theologian, theologians talk about different kinds of sanctification, right. like positional sanctification or progressive sanctification, but it comes down to the same elements, doesn't it? I mean, right. purified, set aside, or dedicated to a holy use. Right. I mean, because in uh, positional sanctification, seen as a, a something of the law God has saved, but even then, that's the set aside. He has set you aside. Hmm. So it still involves setting aside. And then when you move into progressive sanctification, you know, you're living it out, dedicated to, there you are putting, trying to manifest your holy use. Mm -hmm. So yes, no matter what form we're talking about, it, it does involve set aside for a holy purpose. And how is it different than transformation then? Okay, because now we move into, and transformation <laughs> One thing we could we could absorb it into that, but there's a different nuance. I thought that was worth doing this division, even it's even if it seems a slight bit synthetic, because it, there's a different uh, focus we're going for. Uh, now the term for transformation is used only twice in the New Testament, and one of them refers to Jesus. So it's not even us. Is transfiguration is is basically the same word, hmm. but. Uh, here's the second one, another well-known verse, but here's the second one involving us. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right, and the term metamorpho, obviously, if anybody knew a term, metamorphosis like butterflies, and, and yes, it's that, that same word, which transformation means to change form. Mm -hmm. And that's what the word means, change form. A butterfly, same life form, uh, in one state, the essence of its being is this little crawly worm thing, mm -hmm. goes through this transforming and becomes this beautiful pattern that can fly in the air. Mm. So it changes the very essence. And that's what we're saying. This is what we're talking now about people. And in transforming is something we know as people. People can improve themselves. Uh, and, you know, we even say sometimes actors or musicians uh, reinvent themselves. Right. But they're still the same person, really, uh, in another expression. The truth is nobody can change the essence of who they are. That's above our pay grade. So. <laughs> Would the term Jesus used, reborn, fit here? 
I think so, because I, I don't know what kid has never used that saying. So, well, I didn't ask to be born, you know, that one. And, and in a way, they have a point. Sounds like a teenager. Yeah, it sounds like a teenager, right? And then they storm out or <laughs> slam the bedroom door or something. But they have a point in that we have no say of how we're conceived or where we're born. Mm. And in the same way, to be reborn, which is a spiritual thing, uh, we can't do it ourselves. You couldn't make yourself born the first time, can't be born the second time either. Right. Uh, and probably speaking of birth in, in this context, um, the um, second chapter of Acts uh, has a great illustration in the birth of the church. thought maybe you'd read right. that for us. After Peter's sermon and people ask, asked him what to do, in Acts 2 to 38, Peter said to them, Repent and ba be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what exactly would you say is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Which is a great question because it's amazing how many Christians are either confused or get this wrong, you know. All right. Uh, because one, we watch this, it's gift singular of mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. So the gift here is not uh, is not saying so much what the first level of it anyway isn't what, what he gives you. It is the fact his presence is in you and with you to start with. Mm -hmm. So the gift itself is him. And, and like we say, what's a gift? Uh, this is where we're moving from the idea of doing an effort. There is no effort for the person receiving a gift that, uh, other than putting out their hand and receiving. Right. So it's beyond them. If you want to give me or somebody comes and wants to give us a million dollars, uh, so yeah. we'll just put that out on the internet <laughs> now. <laughs> if you want to, you know, go ahead. But we couldn't do anything about that. Um, the only thing we could do is receive. receive. That's as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, your life would change if you had that gift just like the Holy Spirit, but it was beyond your control. All you could do is receive. So you're saying that the presence of God in a person changes their essence and it transforms, right? Right. <coughs> Excuse me here. This is where um, we really get into the transformation thing. And it, it transforms really, I would say, if you want it to be succinct and biblical, two ways, uh, and they balance the equation here on the the resting and the striving the first way is fruits of the spirit when when we talk about fruits of the spirit it's simply talking the effect the spirit has as being a gift and it is now present in you these are this is what happens to you uh, and so maybe you can read that that sure. passage galatians 5 22 and 23 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. Right. And, you know, you look at those, we try to improve ourselves on them to a degree, like, okay, I'm going to try and be more patient, or, uh, you know, today I'm going to try and be kind. And, you know, we'll have a little bit of success maybe for a little while, you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, these things aren't really so much, there's an action that will follow them, but these these are traits of a character these are what a person is. You are a patient person right. by nature or you're not. You're a kind person or you're not. Right. Um, even a joyful person or you're not. So everything we're looking at here are things that a person is or is not. And that all fits into this whole theme of transformation, a change in the essence of who you are. So the fruit is transformation in a person. That's exactly right. The fruit is, if we want to look for... A biblical passage on there you go there's transformation uh, and that's what it means to have the person of God in you on uh, the Spirit of God uh, an example I always love we, we just need to bring Steve in <laughs> our elder Steve because he tells the best stories and you know nobody tells them like him anyway um, but when he was uh, working uh, one of the places he worked in the past uh, he had it, and and I don't know the exact word he used, but we'll just say it was a jerk. <laughs> Somebody who was a difficult person. Mm -hmm. That's how us churchy people say it. <laughs> I'm telling you this in love. You're difficult. Uh, but anyway, this guy, well, it's a jerk. And mm -hmm. uh, he everybody had problems. He was known from being this way. And then all of a sudden, this person was 
like an entirely different person. They were uh, different character traits were coming out. Mm. And Steve was like, what happened to this guy? You know, what's going on? And he, and he asked someone else, and oh, didn't you hear he, uh, last week he got saved, and he accepted the Lord. And, and Steve was kind of like, uh, you know, bonking himself on the head. He's like, why wasn't that the first thing I thought of? Hmm. But that was the point, because, you know, that's what the Spirit does. He transforms. Right. But there's another side to the gift uh, of God's presence as well. And it is called the gifts, plural, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Right. And you're speaking of 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Yeah. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities. But it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Yeah, for the common good. There's so much you can see in there. Mm. Uh, as scripture says, there's a transformation, but transformation uh, within the believer is so they'll be uh, enabled for a purpose. And there was all kinds of purpose going on in what you just read. And right. that's where we're going to is with purpose. Right. That brings us back to that set aside for a holy purpose, right. which is sanctification. Right. And um, one of the most beautiful uh, passages that balances the idea of rest in and strive for, or as we're using the words, transformation and sanctification, sanctification, mm -hmm. the change for a purpose, which implies action. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the full passage of what you already read. And ironically, the maybe not so ironically, that's the way scripture works. Uh, a balance, the one that you read originally on transformation. Okay, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Right, and of course, that's all about God changing on the inside of one's form. Mm -hmm. And that's verses 1 and 2. Now, read now what directly follows what you just read. Romans 12, 3 through 6. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Right. Now, in the Acts chapter 2 picture of salvation, that thing we read earlier, we see God changing the fabric of who we are. Mm -hmm. That's the first two lines of Romans 12 that, that you read. Uh, being called, transformed. So it's the same thing really going on there. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool is by verse 3, what happens is a switch from what we were calling transformation to what we've been discussing as sanctification. Uh, all of a sudden we go from talking about being transformed to uh, purpose and, and change and for the good of all mm -hmm. and instilling these gifts of spiritual ability and that's where human effort will come in because God directs and gives the abilities, but they're manifested through human effort. I can see that. I mean, God didn't carry Paul up that steep path in Turkey. No, I, or I bet the, you Paul wish he did. <laughs> yeah, probably so. <laughs> and, you know, nor did he do the physical talking and, the, you know, associating with the people Paul spoke to. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was all... Paul. <laughs> that was all Paul, you know, in, in, in this thing, this balance we're talking about. And so uh, I guess the way to say it is we work through God's power, but God works through our blood, sweat and tears. Right. Uh, we rest in him in order that we can then strive through him. So mm. it's this marriage of rest and effort. So here's the bottom line for this week. Bottom line from Kathy, who will say, Everything I said in, in a rambling way and three succinct statements. Go for it. Okay. On the genuine Christian walk, we can separate resting in from striving for. They're flip sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. 
the same coin. God does what we can't do for ourselves, but asks us to use what he has done. Mm. And salvation transforms, and sanctification puts that transformation into action. Yeah. It's God's grace manifest, manifested in human effort. Mm -hmm. It's a life where we rest, but also strive. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's this beautiful balance of mm. things, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and it, you know, the thing is, Kath, as we talk about this, maybe people listen, it sounds a bit abstract, but nothing is really more practical because any person, any believer who's prayed, you know, God, use me, they're automatically subject to this balance. How much is going to be God's enablement and how much has got to be the effort you as a person put behind that enablement. And if we get that balance wrong, we end up doing nothing at all or we try to do everything. <laughs> yep. And there's very few of us could say, yeah, we haven't done both. <laughs> right. <laughs> and of course, we know that tragically neither works either. That's right. But if we stay in balance, we can experience victory, which brings us to our featured song from mm -hmm. last Sunday in a bit of New Orleans style. It's victory in Jesus. Yeah, every time I hear this, I want to have Cajun shrimp. I don't know why, <laughs> but anyway. So, um, enjoy, and until next week, be blessed. See ya. Thank you.
you can watch Word for the Week at CanaanCommunity.org. You can also catch our live stream on Canaan Community's Facebook, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app.